Kindly take your seat, we are going to start. Hello, my friends, we are going to start. Thank you so much. Okay. Good morning, everyone. First, first of all, I'd like to apologize for the change of room at, this, at the last minute. It is really um, uh, disappointing and uh, it is uh, really confusing for our attendees. And um, I, do, uh, uh, to, uh, I do apologize for you that this happened. As you know, our session, our session is a workshop about the local content. We have been contacted by the IGF Secretariat and asked to merge our session with, uh, um, uh, with um, uh, the, the IGF Best Practice Forum on local content. They said that this is important because we have the, sa the same target people. And if we do two separate sessions at exactly at the same time, we will have our uh, attendees split in two parts. We agreed on that. And uh, uh, first of all, we will start by the, the, the forum. They will pre present, first present the forum and give some ideas and put them on the table. So I give the floor to Raquel. Thank you very much, Tijani. Uh, my name is Raquel Gatto. I work with Internet Society. I'm also a MAG representative for technical community, together with my colleague uh, Miguel Estrada, also known as Nacho Estrada, <laughs> uh, also from the MAG. We are the co-facilitators for the Best Practice Forum on Local Content. I, uh, and with Wen Deschazenel, I hope I'm saying the name right, <laughs> who is uh, working with us to put together all the contributions and the final uh, outcome document. Uh, but I want to start by saying thank you very much for agreeing on the merge. Uh, the IGF itself has uh, this problem of having multiple sessions, and I think we are setting uh, an example by merging and, and, and creating these discussions together. So uh, it's very relevant. Um, a little bit about the best practice forums. Uh, this is a, a, what we call a part of the intersessional work. The intersessional work has started uh, three years ago. Uh, after the, uh, the working group on the improvements for the IGF recommended more tangible results and concrete uh, results coming out of the IGF. And so um, we have started with this best practice forum collecting, well, first identifying policy options and then collecting real cases on the ground that are putting forward those policies. Um, in 2014, we had uh, the first best practice forums on local content, and it has uh, identified a set of uh, policy options and uh, that would bring this enabling environment uh, for for uh, fostering local content and they do ended up recommending that we should deep dive on uh, re on concrete examples on case studies and look into regional collaboration also and that's where uh, Nacho he started with the idea within the mag and it was uh, finally approved uh, that we should uh, have this best practice forum focused on uh, case studies and examples uh, coming from the community. Uh, what is interesting 
and uh, Nacho is going to talk a little more about the focus this year and when is going to explain on the contributions and the document itself that is up to uh, is still up to comments to the end of the year, which is the, just there. Uh, but it's interesting, just as a wrap up, that um, it's not we we talk a lot about connectivity, uh, but it's not only availability and. Um, and affordability that will bring people online, uh, that will connect the next billion, we need to have relevance. And relevance comes with local content. And then let's see what people are doing and what we could gather from this BPF. Nacho, you want to talk about this year, MAG decision and focus. Good morning to everyone. Um, uh, well, this, this was my second year at the MAG, and I saw in my first year in uh, 2015, I saw there was no uh, little, a uh, little amount of sessions about local content. And then in 20, in, sorry, in 2016, that was that. In 2017, uh, I thought it was a good idea to start working on local content and building uh, uh, over or yeah, over would be the word, uh, the, the the work that has been done before. I checked and there was a, 200, uh, a 2014 local content BPF already, and we could uh, build upon that. Um, the thing is, uh, what came to my mind is that it's not just connecting. You, uh, for example, uh, you could give uh, electricity to, to a town and there will be no uh, factories building uh, instantly. You should start building the uh, necessities over that and start working with people uh, to get more proactive and get uh, uh, become entrepreneurs, so the same as the internet you you first connect and then what do you have to what does the internet gives you it gives the people so uh, in, in that way uh, we started work uh, like we, we started thinking in three kind of approaches uh, first the first one was local content as a driver for development of the local internet this is was more infrastructure related. Uh, for example, for in, in IXPs, local content, local, uh, local hostings, local traffic. Um, there was, uh, this kind of vertical was uh, more related to infra infrastructure. The second, second one was local content to improve access. And there, in this point, we go more in, in relevance. Uh, is, is the content available on the internet relevant for that community? And the third one was local content as an opportunity for economic uh, development. That would be like the third step. First you connect, then you create uh, relevant access, like uh, internet for consumers, and then uh, you create the producers of maybe of those contents or, of, or, or just economic development. So that way we, we thought about digital literacy, digital skills, innovation, and the opportunity of local content in the uh, digital economy. Uh, I'll give the, the mic to Wim, uh, who will get more deeper on that point, maybe. Thank you, Nacho, and good morning, all. Um, like Nacho said, I will dive a little bit deeper in the work we did so far this year and the process of BPFs, and then I think it will also become clear um, why we thought it would be very relevant to have this um, workshop together with you so that you can also contribute or that this uh, workshop can contribute to the work of the BPF instead of uh, competing for each other audience. So the BPF has started, like Nacho said, to collect real examples because that's what um, the intersessional wants to do is collecting practices from everywhere in the world from different areas and bring them, to be, bring them together in, um, in a document, in an output document at the, that is presented and discussed at the, at the BPF and afterwards. I think that's very important um, because it's an opportunity for the organizers from their local project uh, to come and put, give input. And I think that's, another, that's a completely other way of working than having one researcher uh, for one organization looking into um, the topic of local, local content and then try to reach out to people to bring in their con content. Uh, the work of the um, uh, BPF, I think you can look on the, uh, on the IGF website. I think we 
should post the link uh, afterwards. But if you go under intersessional work, there you can find best practice forums. And one of the three best practice forums for this year is the one on local content. Uh, we have been working on, on one hand, putting together a, a document which is more explaining, explanatory, but I think we don't have to uh, dive into that because I'm sure that will come back in the other presentations uh, later today. But the second part, the second part, the second part of our, our work was collecting um, examples. We had, a, we had, and we still have uh, a survey online, in which we want to know from people from all all parts of the world um, what they are doing, what kind of projects they are taking, either to um, help people, or, sorry, uh, either to create content that is relevant for their communities or uh, projects they, um, they put together to enable, to support people, entrepreneurs, to go online, put their own content, uh, content there. Uh, the link is still on the website. It is an invitation to all of you um, to go there, fill in, the, um, uh, fill in your information, fill in uh, or submit your project and um, share, this, uh, share this debate. Um, what we in particular looking for, and I will put some um, of those things on the table here and hopefully they can come back uh, during the discussion or during the workshop and the discussion, uh, is factors, ideas, recommendations that help, that could help projects uh, or people that want to set up a project to become successful. Uh, we collected some, and I said again, rather than doing some online research, we collected them from the people that organize, that have the project, uh, and put them together, share them with uh, everyone after the IGF. Some of those factors that we, until now, found in those projects that, um, uh, that were submitted, uh, was it so important to involve or all stakeholders, all possible stakeholders, talk to them beforehand, uh, make things clear. Also have the local government uh, behind you or at least as a partner in your, um, uh, in your project uh, to help them. Uh, some of those um, um, people or organizations that submitted a proposal also refer to the importance of having uh, a good private partner. A private partner, some say we had a great idea um, but we really uh, needed a, a private partner that could help us either financially or could help us on a technical level to set up a project because um, especially if you look to smaller projects, it can be really challenging uh, to find funds because they don't have, some of the projects don't have a lot of funding. Um, but if one partner could say, okay, we can help you and we can provide you with some uh, technical help, technical assistance, that would be um, a way for, forward. Uh, on the other hand, we also ask for barriers or, or hindrances. Um, those people saw and that say, look, this was really limiting us in trying to, be, to get successful. Uh, some of them in some countries or some areas, they mentioned the cost of the connection that is still very high. That they say, okay, we can put on this project to try to attract people to come online. Uh, but we still know or we still realize that for a lot of people, the cost of just getting online is, uh, is still very high. Um, in other areas, there is uh, still the language issue uh, where often there is a lot of uh, content uh, available or easy to get content available either in official languages of the country or in international languages in English where the um, organizers of the local project say yeah, but we this is not really working for us um, because the the local people we want to reach don't speak either official languages or um, sufficiently or uh, the regional languages another and I think a very interesting point um, that came up is um, the problem with uh, with SMEs and small uh, small entrepreneurs. Um, because I remember in one of the uh, case studies, it came from yeah, they were very very difficult to to reach and to get interested in in a project to create local content, just because they are entrepreneurs, they're small one two person people, 
and usually they only think about working and it's very difficult to reach them uh, they're not coming to a conference they will not come to uh, to a meeting uh, like like an IGF or a local or a regional IGF um, because they they yeah they know they work and the time that they spend at the uh, at the meeting discussing things without immediately return on investment is lost money for them. So these are the number of points. Um, before I give the floor back to Raquel, uh, these are points I hope they were picked up during the rest of the workshop uh, to further discuss, to, to be challenged. I also hope that during, from the other presentations today, uh, we get additional input and ideas on what, uh, what is helping, what is uh, difficult. And um, yeah, let me thank again for um, having the opportunity to do this together and ask you all to look at the document and uh, submit your uh, case studies also so that we can include them. Raquel. Thank you very much, Win and Nacho. Um, I also want just to add that a final outcome document is going to be uh, released in January. So uh, that's just to keep the, the timeline. Uh, and I also see we have uh, contributors from uh, this BPF on the floor. I'm going to uh, to ask Dustin Phillips from I Can Wiki. Uh, he submitted a contribution if he can. Um, just tell us in two, three minutes uh, about the lessons learned and uh, the enablers and uh, barri barriers that, uh, that you face in your project. Please uh, wait a second. Uh, Raquel, you need to say your name before you speak for transcript purposes. Each time somebody is speaking, please start with your name. As I didn't do it, it was Sebastian Bachelet. Thank you. <laughs> Best practices. <laughs> well, my name is Dustin Phillips, and thank you, Raquel. Um, so just a little bit about our project, um, ICANN Wiki uh, just tries to provide an accessible resource on internet governance and the ICANN community and we found it uh, very important and within our mission to extend this content to other languages. Our approach to this is to uh, work with stakeholders based on demand for the language. So if we speak at a conference with a group that is interested in translating that content, then we identify a handful of leaders that can drive the project and our role is primarily to provide a platform on which they can build the content. Um, we usually work with these leaders to identify a core of articles that will be important to summarize the um, ICANN world or internet governance world. And then we basically let them steer the project. Now this has its uh, benefits and occasionally it creates um, a few issues. Uh, the benefits are that the, the content that's created is very relevant to the local community. Um, but occasionally if it's the vision for the project's not clearly in indicated, then we get content that's just out of scope, completely irrelevant or occasionally of um, a quality that doesn't meet our standards. Uh, for example, in East Africa, we had a, a project where we host small workshops. We use that to build uh, a base of content in Swahili and then we're able to use that content to facilitate the next round of workshops. And as we build more content and teach more people how to use the platform, we're able to hold better workshops and provide a better resource. Um, but in a few of these workshops, we gave maybe a little, not enough structure to, or guidance to the project. So we had some articles written about the Toyota Corporation or Toyota.com, which is not relevant to internet governance. So it's finding the right balance um, when taking a kind of an international project that's based in English and extending it to other languages. It's finding the right approach to providing a somewhat of a structure and guidance 
without steering the project. And that's what we found to be uh, a successful model for localizing content. Thank you very much, Dustin. Um, and I see we have he uh, here also Ian Gerlach, I hope I'm saying the name correctly, from Wikimedia. If you can share a little bit about your contributions and the lessons learned from the project, that would be awesome. And uh, if you can say your name better than I do, of course. <laughs> I hope I can say it better. That would be a pity. Um, my name is Jan Gerlach, um, but I will react to Jan as well. Um, I work for the Wikimedia Foundation as a public policy manager, and um, I am happy to be here. Local content, and we usually say locally relevant content, um, is a huge issue for us. Um, we look at it as a matter of access to knowledge, um, as I guess um, many of you you in here agree. Um, so as a platform, as a neutral platform, uh, this is of course a huge challenge as we believe in free knowledge in which we do not want to interfere. So local content creation is really what our community does. Um, they bring um, educational content that is in the public domain to Wikipedia in their own language, currently in um, more than 280 languages, actually. Um, however, this um, there's a huge uh, range. The, um, English Wikipedia, which has actually a lot of uh, content for on, on just any item around the world, on villages in, in Africa or in, in this, maybe also on the Toyota Corporation, most likely, um, there's 5.5 million articles, whereas in um, in the language of, um, I use the example of Sesotho, usually there's, I think, only 530 la uh, articles. And you see this is a huge challenge because the fewer articles there are, the, the, the less people are motivated to, to go to Wikipedia and read or also to um, contribute to it. So that puts us as the steward of the platform into the position that we, while not interfering, need to think about how we can at least um, incentivize people or support people in, in their um, efforts to bring content to, to Wikipedia. Um, and the chapters in different countries that are independent from us do this by organizing edit-a-thons, for instance, where they bring people into a room, people like us, who, who will maybe translate articles from other languages, um, but also when it's actually um, about a locally relevant piece of information, they will come together and, and identify what's missing that can be a, um, a edit-a-thon to close the gender gap, providing more information about um, notable women in, the, in their context or about other topics. So um, it's, it's um, what we try to do is to really support the people to, to contribute that content themselves, but that is, is a very, um, very challenging thing. Thank you very much. Um, and then last, since we have just a few minutes uh, and we need to go for the workshop, um, uh, I would ask if there is any questions related to the BPF itself, if, okay. Um, thank you very much. I, I, I have to confess I'm a rookie of the uh, BPF process, but uh, from the description that I heard. Um, Sorry, my name is Bertrand Moulier and I represent the International Federation of Film Producers Associations. So I suppose um, we're here to um, insert ourselves in, in this process, in this conversation, which we find very exciting. Uh, we've had a look at the document and, and see that perhaps there is room for us to come in with our narratives and perspectives and, and certainly case studies of how local SMEs, as you rightly pointed out, are trying to um, bridge the gap uh, as far as access to mainstream uh, platforms and uh, uh, specialist platforms are concerned for, for content. One of the big issues we're dealing with uh, in the uh, mem member organizations of our federation in developing countries is how market failure tends to operate when it comes to professional entertainment, co uh, filmed entertainment content, which is as much as right uh, for people to receive as, as, as knowledge, for example. Um, because local content of this ilk has the capability to foster uh, the national conversation about all sorts of themes, whether it be cohesive or controversial, it, it participates in freedom of speech and, and, and generally uh, uh, helps uh, enrich people's lives. The problem that a lot of our 
uh, producers have on the ground is that they're competing often with foreign content that has already been amortized in other markets with legacy uh, players and particularly broadcasters who are not willing to partner them in the uh, very high risk uh, endeavor of developing new screenplays, new stories, uh, stories and packaging films and other forms of video entertainment for the local uh, audience. I think the expression locally relevant content is exactly what we're looking at here. So we, we would like to insert ourselves in this uh, process very much, looking at the issue with having a proper uh, entrepreneurs in this field to be present at these uh, fora, we can certainly help with this. And normally it wouldn't be me speaking, but uh, be flank with uh, someone who is actually a producer of, of such content. So just to say that we're here and we'd like to very much to, to participate. Thank you. Thank you question. very much for your contribution. And it's very welcome. I'm, uh, okay, we have to, and then to here. Okay. This is Dr. Subhi Chaturvedi, former MAG member. Uh, many congratulations on the initiative. I uh, completely echo your sentiments when you say there wasn't enough work or workshops or a dedicated track to local language content. Uh, we're looking at about a billion plus connected in India, yet only 28% in terms of internet penetration. And one of the key barriers has been the availability of local language content. So congratulations again. I run a platform where you get young women and girls to write in local languages. One of the key issues, and that's my question to the um, organizers who've been running the platform, are you looking at local niche initiatives and relationships that they're sharing between them? What kind of barriers? And also if, if you're looking at some sort of best practices, because what, they, what we're doing is we're competing with large corporations and we've seen upvoting and the discovery and search of local language content has been one of the biggest challenges when it comes to networks and also some sort of uh, a rights framework where access to that kind of content and when you're looking at platforms and frameworks of collaboration um, and then uh, there's also been related questions of human rights and persecution when you're putting that content online even if it's local language content. Thank you. Thank you very much for both contributions. I'm going to apologize, uh, Siva. We need to close to start the panel, otherwise they won't have time. But uh, after uh, the, 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 the workshop, we are going to, um, to have, sorry, another time for questions and we can follow up. I just want to, uh, on the process, just so to be clear on the process of the inputs. Um, so this year BPF was approved by the MAG uh, on April and we started a little late uh, the discussions. We uh, put a call for inputs for, um, as Wen <coughs> mentioned, a survey uh, where we collected these case studies. Uh, but again, it's not uh, um, a work that you can end uh, right now and I think there is a, a lot of value on continuing this work. Uh, this BPF needs to end by the end of the year so we just have like to next week to receive any comments or uh, next projects and then we are going to submit a final output document. But the MAG uh, usually discusses on the first quarter uh, and approves the BPFs for uh, 2018, right? So uh, I, I see by the, the comments in the room that there is an interest in continuing this work and perhaps having uh, no. a BPF next year. So I would recommend that we, if we can chat later and, and see how we can put this forward, right? Thank you, Rakai. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tijani speaking. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this presentation. It was uh, intended to be shorter, but uh, our workshop was uh, 90 minutes. Now it is less than 60 minutes. Um, I, uh, I found that this uh, initiative is very good. You are trying to set the uh, enabling environment for uh, um, uh, content, for uh, local content. And this is a very good initiative. And I think we have to join your effort. Uh, uh, I personally will join your uh, forum. Our um, workshop was about local content, an opportunity for human, economic, and social development, and free flow of information in underserved region, and the MENA region as an example. As you know, the local, uh, actu uh, now the developing countries and the underserved uh, uh, communities are almost absent on the net. They, only, they are only consumers. Some tell me, no, they are producing on Facebook. 
what are they are producing on Facebook? Nothing. So our community, our regions are not, are not present on the net. And the, the, the local content is the opportunity for our uh, underserved region, for our developing countries to contribute to the content of the, of the internet. We have a lot of opportunities for that. We may have scientific, cultural production, but also with the Internet of Things, we will need a lot, a lot of applications for Internet of Things. We may buy those applications on the shelf from the North, but they will be uh, done by North people for them, not for us. So they will not be uh, uh, relevant, as you say, for our community. And also they will be in, in the other languages. I, our effort is for con local content for, with local languages. So this is the, the, uh, the, uh, the theme of our uh, workshop, and I have uh, six uh, speakers here. I will, sp I will start by Mr. Aziz Hilali, who will uh, uh, more or less set the scene by uh, presenting uh, figures that will allow us to debate local content issues relating to human uh, economic and social development and free flow, free flow of information in MENA region. Aziz is a professor at the University of Rabat in Morocco. He is president of the Mediterranean Federation of Internet Associations. He is also a member of ICANN nominating committee, and he is a founding chair of MISOC and current vice chair. Aziz, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Tijani. <clears throat> Aziz Hilali speaking. Uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, I will try to show some figures and st some statistics that will allow us to debate this important issue relating to human economic social development and the free flow of information in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. For this, we look at, the, at uh, next piece. Yes, good. Uh, for this, we look at, at uh, 498 million people living in 23 countries that uh, you see here in this map. According to world stats, on the total population of this region, the number of internet users is, is uh, estimated at almost half of population. Digital divides in the Middle East and North Africa are narrowing, not only between the Gulf countries and their neighbors, but also between generations and social classes within countries. In terms of uh, internet uh, penetration rates, Middle East and North Africa uh, can be segmented in two, four country groups. The first group included the six uh, high income GCC countries here in blue with the higher internet, internet penetration and high literacy rates. The second one is the small countries in green uh, squeezed between terrible the neighbors and the Mediterranean, their internet penetration is higher because they of their compact and urban nature. The third one, the third group, is formed by the rural, lower middle income countries of North Africa, despite GDP level similar to those of the second group, but a total of 100 mi million unconnected. Citizens live here. The last group of Arab countries with uh, 144 uh, million additional people and about 40 million internet users torn by war, violence, and or poor. Next, please. Here, regarding the use of social media and the use of the uh, content of in local language in the Middle East. All key indicators showing impressive growth. Internet users are up 15% year on year, and social media used 47 uh, in the year. On the most interesting means used in the Northwestern University in Qatar was to look at the 50 most popular websites in Egypt, Qatar, Saudi, and UAE, based on Alex ranking to understand if Arabic was used, uh, and if so, whether Arabic was the primary or secondary language. Even in predominantly Arab countries like Egypt, on, on one third of the top 50 sites visited are not available in Arabic or do not include Arabic as the main language. According to this survey, this is not bad news. 
it is believed that user generated content, especially social media, compensates for this shortfall. According to another study, the McKinsey report released last year, the Middle East is one of the verge of massive digital disruption. In, this, in the past decade, the cross-border data flow connecting the Middle East to the rest of the world is, has increased, increased more than 134. Today, MENA is one of the fastest growing, uh, growing online markets in the world. However, digital is never from country to country, but business and government in all areas are struggling to keep up. The region has the opportunity now to transform itself into a leading digital economy if it can bring stakeholders together to focus on developing the region governance, business, funding, and talent. The future of digital in the Middle East will require the participation of all stakeholders. Next, please. Otherwise, when we look at statistics according to the World Stat website, Arabic has now the largest proportional growth of any major linguistic group with a yearly growth of 7,247 percent. More than that, the Arabic language has risen the fourth rank globally with 124 million Arabic speaking people using the internet. This means that important growth factors in the digital market seems to be in place. On the other hand, all surveys conducting the region lead to the same conclusion. Effort to promote Arabic content online are most visible on social network, where Arabic is slowly overtaking English as the predominant, predominant pardon, online language and interface in many regions. These social media platforms are also increasingly seen as a major source of news in, in Arab uh, countries. Nearly 30% of Arabs prefer social media as the main source of information. Finally, I would like to share with you, next please, I will uh, to share with you the conclusion of study conducted by uh, stakeholders, including ICANN, strengthening the digital economy of MENA region through a collective effort, government should focus their long-term effort on four areas, provide affordable connectivity, ensure the availability of the relevant content, build digital capitalities, Establish practices and support policies. I will stop there because uh, otherwise Tijani will, uh, will be not happy. Thank you very much, Aziz. Tijani speaking. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Aziz, for this presentation. Uh, yes, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, that's why uh, we should be to really to uh, comply with the slot of time we decided on. Our next speaker will be Rula Mikhail. Mikhail. Rula is a journalist. She is executive director of, the, of Maharat, a Lebanese NGO working on uh, freedom of expression and media development. Rula will speak about opportunities for sustainability of digital media platforms in the MENA region. Rula, please. Uh, thank you. Good morning. So I will uh, talk specifically about uh, the digital media content, the challenges that the alternative digital media platform face and the opportunities that would advance the vi viability of such digital platforms, which will contribute definitely in de developing a diverse Arabic digital content. Uh, it's well known. Uh, that media blossoms in times of political change and technology revolution. And we are living nowadays under both circumstances. Since the Arab Spring and the political transition uh, that happened in many uh, Arab countries, new digital media platforms started to, ex to exist suddenly, profiting from uh, the new political environment uh, that allows more freedom of expression, 
here the internet and the existing uh, technological tools offer a real opportunity for ent enthusiastic activists and journalists to start creating more progressive content in Arabic. Uh, a content that has a purpose to inform the public and to challenge existing political regime and reflect different point of view. Uh, a content that breaks the taboo subjects. In our region, in the MENA region, there are a lot of taboos and uh, here this red line affects the content sometimes or most of the time. Starting uh, uh, from not being able to criticize any public figures or to address sexuality, for example, uh, religion, human rights uh, violation and so on. Uh, this new Arab content, or this new progressive, progressive Arab uh, uh, content improves a few existing content. But sad to say that only few independent media platforms found a way to keep creating a good content, but not on a regular basis. Uh, here comes the question, how can we or how can these emergent platforms or any nascent media project ensure their viability and what, it's, what is needed to keep them functioning and contributing to the local content in order to keep the new diversified media scenery? Uh, from our experience uh, as an organization working on media development, we can say that there are many challenging uh, challenges facing the content creation of quality media content, starting from the access to information, uh, challenges uh, that investigative reporting face, access to the internet, the restrictive media laws sometimes, the dangerous work environment also, it's something to note, the filtering, blocking and shutdowns of new platform and so on, and, uh, and here in some uh, Arab countries, not on all the Arab countries. So uh, in addition to all that, uh, we have also the lack of media management skills among the new, new media startups, and as well the lack of a culture of innovation. Uh, in order to strengthen the capacities of these platforms, it's important to prov provide their leaders and managers with adequate skills to find their business models, and that's what we uh, start to do uh, as an or uh, organization working in the ground uh, in Lebanon and in the MENA region. So even so, uh, capacity building is not enough. Further aspects should be addressed. Public policies that support uh, and encourage new media projects that will contribute in promoting uh, diversity, good governance and accountability, along with uh, incentives uh, that allow them finding viable business model. Uh, also to note uh, a point regarding information and media literacy that fosters the critical thinking among youth and audiences, uh, audiences in general in order to support the quality content and the role of media in informing citizens. Uh, the last point that I want to highlight, it's in rooting a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship among the young generations to start launching their own project to contribute in creating uh, uh, innovative digital content that respond to the, uh, to the local needs. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rula. You were on time. Wonderful. Our next speaker will be Glenn. Is Glenn here? Is Glenn McKnight? who is a member of ISOC Board of Trustees. He is also former chair of ICANN Naralu and current secretary. He is active volunteer in IEEE, he, and he is uh, um, especially um, active in Toronto and also uh, IEEE Smart Village. Glenn will speak about IEEE activities focusing on underserved communities in Canada and uh, developing countries. Please, Glenn, go ahead. Thank you to Jenny. Uh, it's my pleasure to be on the committee. Um, there's a, uh, I do not have slides, so I'm not going to put you to sleep, and I'm not going to talk very long. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is some of the ways we approached our 
creating content and providing it to communities which can then turn around and use the materials as open education resources, OER. So let me share with the first story that I'd like to share with you is um, IEEE has 460,000 engineers around the world. And those individuals are very concerned about improving their I would say professional development, it's uh, their accreditation, and how do you do this? And, and especially since most of the content at the IEEE Collaboratech is in English. Uh, and one of the mandates that IEEE has decided to do is on internet governance. And they have the internet in inclusion program. You'll see that uh, they have a booth at uh, our location here. Uh, and they're uh, one of the leaders in terms of the, uh, I would say, the technical background uh, platform that we all share using the internet. Now, what is interesting is I worked with IEEE and developed an online course. And the course is uh, uh, pr provided free. It's open to anyone. It's on Eli Anime, and it's an introduction to internet governance. And what's unique about the product is that uh, over the last I don't know, maybe Olivia, you can refresh my memory. Eight, 10 years, I've been interviewing Olivia and people like Olivia throughout the ICANN ecosystem and beyond. So probably about 270 short videos are provided in the content plus audio uh, podcasts as well as slideshows. So the content is media rich. And the idea is to provide the content for free as an OER. But I've reached out to the wider community in this community as well, saying if anyone's interested, it's I'm doing it as a Creative Commons license, uh, in any part of the world, you're welcome to the content for free. So I had a number of people approach me, say, yes, we will translate it to Arabic. They disappear. Yes, I'll do it into Portuguese and they disappear. So again, it's a standing offer, you know, if you want to the, contact me, I'm more than happy to work with you. And, uh, and I really encourage the material to be translated into local uh, languages and it's a, a fantastic resource that, that's a seminal resource for on internet governance. And it's only one resource. It's not uh, like anything else. It gets stale like bread. If the longer it's there, it needs to be updated. It needs, it needs current content. The second thing, and, and this is what Shijani introduced me on, is two other projects I'm involved with, with IEEE. One is Smart Villages. Smart Villages was created as a, a, um, an effort between the UN Foundation and IEEE Foundation to look at the sustainable development challenges. And we looked at three in particular. Uh, one is reliable electricity, two is communications, and three is patient records or individual records. And the area that I focused on was reliable electricity. We looked at prototypes of one kilo, kilowatt uh, systems as well as energy kiosks. So we've been rolling out this program around the world and we first started doing it in Haiti and, um, and it was a, a model, a very interesting model because even though it has a very American slant into it, uh, on it because it's not a gift, it's a partnership. So the idea of providing reliable electricity is critical for all of us, even though the education is one of those sustainable development goals. If you don't have reliable power, you don't have you know, a, a reliable mesh network. If you don't have a reliable mesh network, you don't, you're not connected to the net. It's the want of a nail in, in terms of the battle. So we, we focused on partnerships around the world to on the reliable electricity. But again, the, the electricity is just a tool to enable education, local content creation. The third thing I've been involved with in terms of content is uh, internationally is with IEEE, is IEEE site. That's the special interest group on humanitarian technology. And uh, three volunteers were at the IEEE booth and they were from Tunisia and they've done a number of projects. And again, that's a funding window as well. If you have an IEEE uh, section in your country, uh, approach them, there's twice a year, 
uh, windows of opportunity to apply for some funding. And so I, again, that's, it's all part of the IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee, and I believe Satish sits on that committee still. And it's, it's a, a very important in terms of content creation and development is having an adequate amount of funding and an audience to, ta to take uh, access to it. So I believe that's all I have to say about uh, the IEEE efforts. Uh, the, oh, sorry, I, I forgot the one thing, is we're hoping with our own foundation working with is to roll out one million victory gardens, in, which is focused on content on agriculture. So my wife and I have been working on that for a number of years. We have a demonstration site with an off-the-grid solar system at our, at our farm location in Canada. And uh, we are looking at replicating that model in, in different parts of the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Our next speaker will be Layal uh, Bahnan, Bahnam, who is a legal expert and the program manager at Maharat Foundation. Layal will speak about the need to improve legal frameworks in the MENA, in the MENA region to encourage local content creators. Layal, please. Thank you, Tijani. Uh, thank you for having me on this panel. So what I would like to share uh, with you, no, he said my name, Layal Bahna. So uh, what I like to share is a point that we don't talk a lot about it whenever we talk about local content, which is the legal frameworks, as you said. So if we look at the main creators of local digital content in the MENA region, so they are developers, researchers, journalists, and bloggers. So for them to develop uh, local digital content that response to the needs of uh, the local communities, they need access to information in order to be able to use, reuse, and distribute the content again. So based on that, there is a main gap in the MENA region when it comes to the laws and legal frameworks allowing content creators to access information. So if we had an overview on the availability of access of information laws in different countries in the MENA, we will see that such laws either they do not exist or they exist but they are not really put in practice. And even if they exist, they are more likely like a formality more than tangible tools to guarantee access to information because they are either ambiguous or they are inefficient when it comes to complaints mechanisms most of the time. For example, if we took Jordan, in Jordan there is a law, but it is not in line with international standards. Also, governments and public administrations allowing free flow of information is still the exception, not the rule. Also, there is a lack of awareness among journalists and citizens regarding the existence of the laws themselves. Also, the timelines of administrations and the procedures to request information are too complicated. And there are few cases where journalists or citizens file complaints to the Information Council because the Council's decisions in all cases are not binding to administrators who refuse to provide information. In Lebanon, a draft law on access to information has been passed recently in 2017, but it was linked to a body that should receive complaints and should monitor the implementation of the law. But unfortunately, it was, this body has not been formed yet, so the administrations do not feel the obligation to start publishing information even if this exists in the law. And journalists and citizens also, they do not practice this right as it requires a lot of formalities and time and editorial newsrooms, lack of resources and culture even to invest in such procedures as well. So if we want to talk about opportunities, here comes the role of the civil society organizations to help raise awareness about this right and challenge administrations to apply it and monitor its use. And this is what's happening in many countries in the Arab region. So also, the challenge is not only limited to access to information laws and their existence, because their existence will not lead automatically to develop local digital content, because there comes another issue, which is governments and public administrations who decide to publish their data, how are they publishing them? Are they publishing them in open formats, free of charge, thus available for others to use them in an innovative way to produce local digital content that has value? So the answer is in all countries in the MENA, no. And this is a main challenge that is not deeply tackled and that affects directly the creation of digital content, cultural, environmental, financial, economical, social. Open data will give the opportunity to content creators to analyze, use, and reuse 
in innovative ways. Few initiatives exist in the MENA region, such as the Lebanese Open Data Initiative that is led by ISOC in Lebanon, but more work is needed to spread the importance of open data among governments, highlighting the crucial role of open data and local digital content in growth. More challenges when we talk about re legal, legal frameworks re related to privacy, especially when we say that there are access to information laws, but, and, and when we talk about the necessity of having open data. So also there is a lack of interest in working for, further in our region on copyright laws, for example. And other laws as well impact the development of digital local content, such as the harsh provisions related to online speech. I think Khalid will talk about uh, about uh, this these, uh, this point. Also, they're talking about the policies and the will of of uh, of, of uh, the states in the MENA to uh, to improve the local digital content. When we talk about public media, that has also uh, a role to play in developing uh, local uh, local uh, content. Now, all media platforms are online, so they would be contributing in increasing digital content. But unfortunately, public media are not really investing in producing local content that responds to the need of local communities, as most of them are only mouthpieces of their governments and do not have strategies for local production, or they are not applying them. So what the, the work is big to do, so civil society has a lot to do, and also governments need to acknowledge the importance of introducing supportive policies and incentives to advance local digital content, and the civil society should play lot, a big role at both advocacy and awareness levels. So this is where I stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leal. Next speaker will be Khaled Ibrahim, who is the executive director of the Gulf Center of, for Human Rights. And he will um, speak about ongoing attacks on online activists and its impact on human, economic, and social development across the MENA region. Khaled, please. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Raj uh, Tijani. My name is Khaled Ibrahim. I'm the executive director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights. And uh, first of all, I really feel unhappy about the underrepresentation of the MENA region in the IGF. Maybe we have problems. Uh, we are not uh, uh, adopting the multi stakeholder uh, approach in our in, uh, various initiatives in MENA, but uh, still the international community and the various institutions, they have an obligation to provide us with uh, schemes or fellowships to uh, allow our uh, uh, youngest uh, generation to attend and to participate effectively in the IGF. Now, in five minutes, this is the outcome of uh, this workshop, uh, is the outcome of three workshops, uh, and we have five minutes to speak about uh, the link between the various stages of uh, local content, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, we have four uh, stages to create a local uh, content that is uh, suitable and that is addressing the needs of communities in MENA, uh, the, the creation, the preservation, dissemination, and then utilization. But uh, we have a problems, and uh, the problems that we have with uh, all these stages of uh, uh, having a local uh, content is affecting the work of online activists and affecting the work of civil society. Uh, now, one of uh, the main problem uh, is the lack of uh, network uh, neutrality. Uh, the, the internet service providers, mostly, they are either the governments or uh, pro-governments, uh, companies, or on occasion, the intelligence services. So that will not uh, uh, allow us to enjoy the main principle of uh, network neutrality, which is having free and open access to the internet, uh, an internet that will uh, meet uh, meets the needs uh, of the people. Now, my colleague uh, Leal uh, talked uh, about the legal restrictions, and I just add to that uh, the fact that uh, cyber crimes uh, legislations are used to imprison online activists. We have a lot of examples. I have no time to list of names. Uh, Raif Bedouin, so Arabia, Nabir Rajab in Bahrain, Osam in Najjar in the United Arab Emirates, a lot of people. There is no time, five minutes, not enough to read the names. Uh, what we need in MENA is uh, the adoption of uh, progressive uh, policies and initiatives to encourage uh, local content creators to have a free space, to enjoy a freedom of expression 
online and offline. Now, the, the lack of social justice, the digital divide, like in Yemen, there is a war. In Syria, there is a war. In Libya, there is a war. In Iraq, there is a war with Daesh. All that is affecting uh, the access of the population to the, the, to the internet. And when uh, we know for sure that the traditional media is owned by governments, uh, and then when we want to use uh, the social media to express uh, our views, we will uh, meet a lot of challenges. I talked to my colleagues about some of them, uh, but uh, how we could uh, uh, narrow in the, uh, the digital divide that we have in, in MENA uh, if, if still uh, governments, they are trying to uh, regard the civil societies uh, as, as enemies. Uh, when you regard a civil society organization as enemies, there is no way that you could share values, values of uh, stakeholder uh, uh, approach values of uh, uh, respecting the fact that uh, there is no creation of local content without respecting public freedoms, including the freedom of expression. So uh, in order to ensure the free flow of uh, information, knowledge, data, all that, we have to uh, stick to the standards of uh, principles, standard that, uh, uh, standards that are adopting uh, in the rest of the world, which is we have to uh, provide internet that is free and accessible to citizens. We have to respect the work of online uh, activists who are trying their best to uh, talk about uh, public affairs, who are trying to defend people's rights. It is, we are in the 21st century. It is not the time to put uh, an activist in prison just uh, because of a tweet saying, stop the war in Yemen. That is Nabil Rajam in, 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 in Bahrain. He is serving three years and is still in prison. Osama al-Najjar, he just put a tweet saying, my father is innocent, Hussein al-Najjar, a prisoner of conscience. He is defending the rights of the people, including his, uh, his father. He is still in prison, although he served the sentence, three years in prison for a tweet, he is still in prison. The government of the United Arab Emirates uh, saying he's a threat to the state. A blogger is a threat uh, to the state. So what I am saying to conclude, it is five minutes, uh, what we need, we need to work together to uh, uh, create uh, knowledge-based societies that respect freedom of expression, respect human rights, respect the diversity of culture. We have to develop that. We have to work together. We have to accept the fact that social, uh, so, so, civil society organizations are not enemies. They are uh, partners and reliable partners. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled, for this uh, intervention. And uh, the last but not the least, Marie Noemi Mark. Marie Noemi is a public and regulatory affair working in the regulatory department of Orange in charge of trade and internet governance. She uh, will speak about, uh, uh, she will address the access to internet and the uh, level of development of internet uh, infrastructure based in the uh, on the experience of Orange Group in MENA region. She said that uh, since uh, one of the main factors impeding the creation of local content uh, in the underserved region is the access to internet, she will make this intervention. So, uh, Marie Naomi, please. Microphone. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, yes, I am the last one to speak today, but my subject is an unavoidable layer allowing for the development of local content and digital services. Uh, even if uh, uh, the BFF on local content does not take into account connectivity because, uh, well, it's not the subject, the center of the subject. Um, well, local content is an opportunity for human economic and social development in underserved regions too, and uh, local content cannot thrive without the deployment and extension of internet broadband infrastructures. Um, here I will deal with two topics. The need for an uh, enabling environment for the digital transformation of the society through the deployment of local content, development of local contents. And the second point, uh, the practical solutions that can be addressed and that do we address for broadband deployment in rural and remote EA uh, underserved regions. My first point is that we believe 
that the digital transformation of the society represents an essential engine for social development, economic growth, and jobs creation. In the MENA regions, like in other countries, uh, ICT applications are expected to bring benefits to all aspects of life in terms of learning, healthcare, agriculture, digital, government services, businesses, etc. Um, of course, the digital transformation shall include governments, citizens, and businesses. Um, in this respect, internet broadband infrastructure is paramount to ensure connectivity to all, uh, to allow the development of new and innovative services, local services, uh, and to achieve a transition to digital society and economy. Um, it's right that in, in the underserved regions, uh, mobile technology will continue to play a dominant role in internet connectivity expansion, as uh, fixed is uh, not that easier in uh, remote areas, uh, at least in medium terms. Um, two important things have to be addressed here. Uh, it is very important to continue this extension, this expansion, to uh, have an enabling regulatory policy in place and a business environment open to investment and innovation. This is important for infrastructures as well as for local uh, services. Uh, and this is uh, important for all the things that are very important to the to the life of the peoples locally uh, for all these services that can be developed and serve the interests of the people in terms of healthcare, of learning, agriculture, finance. All this is very important for the people. Uh, in terms of uh, cost-effective solutions that can be uh, contemplated and that can we, we use uh, to, uh, to, to uh, continue the broadband deployment in remote areas, in uh, Rural areas, uh, um, we, for example, we, co we, we think that we have to uh, develop cooperation between governments, financial institutions, and operations and operators for the building building of international uh, backbones, terrestrial backbones, submarine, if uh, if it is the case. Uh, we have to uh, foster the common and share or shared infrastructure co-siting solutions in these remote areas to avoid unnecessary deployment of, of infrastructures. Also to, uh, to apply, to use satellite solutions where applicable and if necessary. And it is very also important to use uh, adapted energy solutions to address shortages in terms of uh, network rollouts and uh, uh, devices usage. And the adapted energy solutions uh, are also can be also used for the powering of cell towers. And every uh, energy solution um, will be adapted to the problem identified. We can be it locally, I mean. Uh, it can be based on uh, solar, uh, on wind, etc. or cooperation with a supplier, an electricity supplier. Then we, uh, we are working on it and uh, we are addressing this problem. And uh, this is also very important to, uh, to implement an efficient internet architecture, allowing traffic routing and bandwidth uh, optimization. Also, it has to be, uh, to be uh, taken into account that the spectrum policy is very important also to have good solutions in these areas. Then this is uh, my point, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marie Noemi. As you have seen, um, our, the aim of our workshop was to raise awareness about the importance of local content. Local content, in my point of view, will be a challenge for developing countries and underserved community to have their presence on the net, because now they are not present. We had um, uh, different perspectives on this panel, and uh, I hope you will uh, have questions for our uh, panel and also for uh, the members of the, of, of the forum. Uh, I, I would like to tell those people of the forum that I really want to integrate their, their uh, team because I do think that we need also to go to the implementation more or less, to, to, to go to, to build 
an, uh, um, um, uh, an enabling environment for local content because now that's right that we have a lot of ideas but how to how to implement them i think this uh, forum will be a way to try to do that so i open the floor for questions the questions are for our panel and for the forum huh? i have a, i have already a queue one what okay 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 shiva Oh. Yeah, uh, my name is Siva Subramanian. I'm from Internet Society India, Chennai. I see the problem of uh, local content as a fourfold problem. One that of uh, encouraging local content to be placed online in the local space. And second, uh, getting available global content to the local space. And third, the content locally created and available transferred to the global space. And fourth is a unique problem of uh, identifiers of local content. Uh, ICANN came up with uh, the international domain names, uh, which is uh, in layman's language, uh, domain names in local language, local script. Uh, when uh, that solved a certain problem of uh, no. making local users use a domain name, but uh, the local names and local script becomes uncommunicable to people of other language communities. So the content locally created tends to get confined in the local space. So the fourth problem is that of uh, making local identifiers understandable or translatable to the global internet space and thereby make local content available to the global internet space is uh, the communities that are working on local content looking at all the four aspects of uh, local content issue that's my question thank you thank you shiva and please make your questions short okay the second question. Mine is not a question, so it cannot be short as you request, but I hope that you mind, you don't mind about that. I'm Giacomo Mazzone from the European Broadcasting Union and I offered um, many times to contribute to the BPF. Can you please, can you please introduce yourself? S sorry? Your name. Giacomo Mazzone oh. from European Broadcasting Union. Um, I say that um, we offer to cooperate with this um, best practice forum. Unfortunately, well, it has not been possible for various reasons. Uh, I send contribution uh, on the paper just to, because I think that uh, as has been said by Bertrand Mouillet representing the uh, producers, the film producers, um, I represent the broadcasters. We have nine unions around the world covering all the countries of the UN. Uh, and we are present in all the regions. Um, our, just to give you an idea about the, only the European dimension, uh, where we have the, um, the public service broadcasting, um, in 2016, public service broadcasters in Europe have invested 18 billions, 18 billions in co local contents. This, just to give you an idea, is 10 times more or less what invests Amazon Video and is four times what invests Netflix, with the main difference that these are local contents for local audience in local languages and possibly minority language. This is possible, why? It's possible because in Europe we pri privilege the possibility to invest through public bodies that are the public service broadcaster with obligation to invest in local contents. This is a multiplicator effect, this is a benefic beneficiary effect that e create pluralism, pluralism of contents and diversity of contents in Europe. Is this, uh, there is an opportunity now in the MENA region, because I think that the focus is mainly on MENA regions, you have four countries that are going through their new audiovisual law, uh, and there is the opportunity, as has been mentioned by the Lebanese colleague before, to transform uh, this, the state uh, broadcasters of the past into something different. That could be a dynamic for the pluralism on, on the informat information for the news of the region, but could be also an opportunity for the local production. Because uh, this, for us, is a very simple way to access to it. You don't have anymore to look for the single content. 
And this has another beneficiary effect on the old system, on the old ecosystem. The, the, if you produce local content, small contents for the websites, and you don't have major uh, attractive contents, even entertainment contents, you know that the, the platform doesn't work. If you look at what people watch on YouTube, uh, they watch for big shots, they watch mainly for highly professional produced contents that you have already. So we are going to the convergence in our country is already reality in other parts of the region of the world, in other regions of the world will be a reality soon. So why you don't work on in this direction? And we have offered our cooperation and renew um, my um, will, willingness to cooperate. Last week, and I finished there, um, we were at the UNESCO for the Convention on Cultural Diversity. And we present there, at their request, a report on the contribution that's been given to the local contents uh, in Europe. And we are now planning to do the same on a worldwide base. So for the future is a good element to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, this is a good uh, contribution from uh, uh, you as a broadcaster. You are, uh, the, you are the European broadcasters. Um, I think that it is a good example that you gave. And uh, I don't know if uh, you, uh, is, there, is it in, um, in Lebanon that you have already, uh, you said that uh, some countries in the MENA region? I, in theory, in each of the, this country exists uh, national broadcasters, hmm? um, or even more than one. But this national broadcaster, at the moment, they don't have uh, any kind of obligation as we have in Europe. So this is the problem why, and also the lack of financial resources. So Tel Liban is in a starving situation since years. They have barely the money to pay the salaries. So I think that if, if we want to change these countries, I think that the, the, the media world is a key, an enabler for everybody. Okay. And we are doing some specific action on that as EBU, uh, for instance, um, because as you know, we have members also in the, in the MENA region within the European Broadcasting Union. Um, we have launched a project that is called Generation What, that um, with an invest in investment of 1 million euro more or less, that is just to bring the broadcasters into the, uh, into the online world, because this is the main lack they are bro good broadcasters eventually, but they are not present online. While in Europe, BBC is the first content okay. provider okay. online. Okay. So why not also? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Thank, thank you. Thank, can I continue? Uh, thank you, Chair. My name is Luke. I'm from Botswana. Uh, it's a developing country. I think my question is, is, is to all of the panelists. It's probably a, a difficult question, but a very basic question. You see, from our side of the world, we really struggle with this issue of local content, and you are always out there with the community trying to encourage them to come up with local content. And our biggest problem, of course, is the competing international quality good content. The, the, the question that I just wanted to pose is, from your experience, um, what, what, what would be the type of content that would really, you know, project a, a, a local community, especially in the developing uh, 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 context? I mean, I think really that, that would be my, I just want to look for a guide or some experience that, that you know, so the, the, the local creativity growing from a particular type of content. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Just to help you out, Mo which country is it? Moment. Dorothy. Oh, oh, sorry. Ah. Yeah. Please. Walid. Hi, my name is Sajda Wishtuki, and I'm from the Walt Disney Company. Um, it was great to hear about the Middle East because that's a region that we're not very active in, but it's definitely a really interesting one. So I'd like to hear a bit about how an enabling environment can be best supported in the Middle East for Disney specifically, having strong copyright laws as well as e-payment systems, of course, is really important for our work in any region. So I'd like to hear if you know of any countries that are working to support those aspects. I know that there are a lot of challenges in the Middle East, so we get to see what countries we should perhaps keep an eye out on. Thanks. Thank you very much. Walid, please. Yes, Walid Al-Sakaf. 
Um, I'd like to bring us back to a point we raised on the first day of the IGF. Uh, I don't know, it was exactly this room, and it was under the title, Data is the New Oil. And at the time, we said that there is a lot of data. In fact, there are many Facebook interactions, there are um, various YouTube channels, but much of the data is not used. It's mod monetized uh, by uh, Western companies that then utilize it for generating profit and getting the consumers to pay again with more data. So what strategies and policies do you recommend for the uh, region to bring back ownership of this data to the region instead of having it exported? And how can that play a role in advancing the cause of not only generating data, but generating relevant and useful data for the region? Thank you very much. Dorothy. Yeah, I think when we talk about content, there are all kinds of content. And um, what my colleague in Botswana was saying, what we see is definitely local music is always content that people are happy and willing to access. Um, we see that there's a lot of production now of small two-minute videos, usually jokes, um, life mixed with animation that people are exchanging on their phones. So you don't have to worry about what is the good content. We just have to make sure that the creative communities have that freedom to post the content. And then you can observe what is popular and try and imitate it. But what we see is things which are anchored in culture. Something in Ghana, you know, there's nothing more important than a funeral. Weddings, forget that. Funerals are big business. So we will see lots and lots of funerals as online content so that people are looking at how you arrange funerals. I'm just giving examples. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Um, uh, je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Um, yes, just to, just a further comment, if I may, from the perspective of the independent content film entertainment producers we represent uh, in MENA region and, and elsewhere, the, the perennial issue they have is how they can assemble sufficient working capital to develop quality content of the kind that uh, local, local uh, citizens expect, rightfully. And um, it was interesting to hear my colleague uh, Giacomo Mazzone from the European Broadcasting Union talk about the efforts to deploy or redeploy local broadcasters as partners to this uh, creative endeavor, which is also a business endeavor. Um, we also have to factor in the new generation of, of players in this marketplace, and especially the over-the-top uh, OTT uh, platforms. I think one of the challenges for the uh, developing countries that we work with is to, um, to have uh, an ability to complement the content that will come through the large OTT operators, which perhaps should remain nameless in this context, which bring, as our Indian colleague said, uh, global content to local uh, viewers, which is an interesting <coughs> proposition. But it's, what's really interesting in regulatory and business enablement terms is what happens to local players who are able perhaps to optimize local content better than anybody else, but need a business model that is actually sustainable. Uh, I'm thinking about Iroko TV in, in Nigeria, for example, an example I've used in the past. They are able to understand uh, not only what local people want to see in terms of um, uh, Nollywood films, but also to price uh, access to their, to their films on their platform uh, in an optimized way that corresponds to the, uh, realistically to the purchasing power of local people. These platforms actually started life servicing the, uh, the, the middle class diaspora in the United States, the UK and elsewhere. And their challenge now is actually to uh, bring content to local people, be it on mobile telephony, as uh, the lady from Orange uh, re re referred to, or, or on, on, uh, on other platforms. And there, this is where we think we'll be interested in the panel's views on how to create a business uh, kind of uh, enablement strategy to, to enable local producers to actually sustain businesses, contribute to jobs and, and exports and innovation in this respect. Thank you very much. Uh, before giving the floor to the panel to answer those questions or uh, comment on those uh, comments, I will uh, uh, first uh, introduce our remote um, uh, moderator, Mr. Sebastian Bachelet, 
who is a former member of the uh, ICANN board, actual member of uh, the AFNIC, and he is also now member of the at-large advisory committee, committee at ICANN. Also, let me introduce our uh, rapporteur, Mr. Olivier Crépin Leblon, who is uh, uh, a chair, uh, uh, former chair of at-large advisory committee at ICANN and current chair of URALO. Now, for the questions, who wants to start? Rola? Okay. Quickly, just, and I want to mention that, of course, uh, while like talking or, or tackling l l local content, the four uh, aspects that you mentioned uh, are respected, and there is a lot of like different stakeholder working to ensure not only producing of the content, but also distribution. But uh, I focused, I chose to focus on the creation of, uh, of the local content because that's what we are working on it now, and just to, uh, to shed the light on the challenges, because there is like a real challenge, ch ch challenges on the creation. So just to, to start with the point of creating a local content and a local content that really, that serve, uh, l l serve needs of the people to be informed. I'm talking, ho I'm to talking here about media and the good governance, media and accountability and the role uh, of the media as a watchdog. Uh, and we all know that sometimes there is like a lot of restriction uh, even uh, to freely express uh, opinion or even to freely choose some topics and go deeply and uh, uh, create a content around it and provide it to the audience. So it's a challenge. For, uh, challenges. So for this reason, we choose to, 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 to only focus on the creation of the content. Of course, talking about business model, it's very, very important. Uh, uh, and that's what we are trying now to promote more and more. Uh, still, our younger generations, they don't feel how much they can really profit from all um, the opportunities that the internet and the revolution and technology brought to us. So we still have this culture when we finish our, for example, when we will be graduated, we will search for an employment. So what we are trying to do, just to, um, uh, to work with also with, with, uh, with um, uh, some university and uh, uh, invite the students to think outside the box and feel that they can really uh, contribute uh, create their own uh, uh, content, make their own production. So there is a lot of, of work needed here just to find also a sustainable model for uh, the initiatives that we can see around in the, in the region. Yes, and uh, this is something that this forum can help to do. Uh, and before giving the floor to uh, Khaled, who wants to, uh, uh, to comment, uh, I'd like to ask Sebastian if we have uh, remote questions. No. Okay. Khaled, please. Uh, very quickly, the EU, like uh, you talked about, uh, you know, the fact that uh, there's no uh, any uh, reliable initiatives uh, with regard to broadcasting. But the reality, uh, we still uh, hoping that the EU could uh, do a lot with regard to capacity building to the various uh, uh, institutions that we have across the MENA region. And also, uh, the EU needs really to put human rights before uh, profit when they are dealing with governments in the region. It is very important to implement the EU guidelines on human rights. As to the World Bank, I, I think you have a good opportunity in some countries they are starting to use the uh, e-payment like in Iraq and other countries. Uh, I think uh, uh, Walid mentioned something very important. We still consumers uh, and that uh, really needs to be uh, tackled, addressed. Uh, we need to uh, uh, analyze the data in, uh, in order to create information and convert it, them to, to knowledge that will be useful for the uh, humanity. But all that, uh, of course, it's not uh, something very simple. Uh, it needs a, a whole uh, it's a strategy that will uh, allow everybody to contribute. As you know yourself, we have first to solve a lot of problems that we mentioned, me and my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. Who else? 
Yes, Leal, please. Uh, I just want to add uh, regarding Walid's question. So uh, you asked about policies in the region that could bring back the ownership of the data. So there, uh, there are many incentives that 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 can be given to really encourage people to more use and reuse the data. There, I will give the example of Lebanon. Let's say the, what the BDL, what the Banque du Liban did when when uh, when they issued a circular to support startups. So it was the time when the startups were booming because of this support of the central bank. So there was a policy to encourage uh, the, this ecosystem. And, th and this is what should be done. So governments should really invest in, in, this, uh, in this part and provide incentives when it comes to policies or to other circulars or any kind of encouragement to support ecosystem whenever it comes to creating data and uh, having ownership to the data and creating local content as well. So they, the, the policies in this place can encourage people to have more content, local content, and to have this ownership of the data. Regarding the copyright laws, unfortunately, uh, in, in many countries, in, the, in, the, in many places in the MENA, there are no intellectual, intellectual property laws, or if they exist, they are not enforced, but, but we can feel now that the attitudes are, be, are beginning to change. For example, as well, in Lebanon, with the booming of the startups and many applications that are now being invented and created, so there is a uh, 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 an attitude from the government to protect more and more intellectual property, and they started as well uh, talking about uh, about uh, further enhancing the laws that would protect such rights, and the same for e-payments. So, in all the countries in the MENA, there is the legislative path is really slow. So, for the the e-transactions law, it has been in the Parliament for 12 years till now, and till now it has not been adopted. But because of this political will to support the, the, this hub that is being currently vibrant in Lebanon. So even the laws are being are being uh, uh, there. There is a political will to uh, provide further laws that are supportive in this uh, in this uh, area. So and uh, uh, what else? The public broadcast as well. This is why I mentioned it because of course it's an opportunity. We think that it's a great opportunity to increase digital local content. But also, unfortunately, it's related to political will because even even the term public broadcast do not exist in the MENA. So what we call the the the, the, the public broadcast, it's called official uh, state. Uh, state or state uh, state uh, TV and not public broadcast. And we keep correcting the concept so the concept does not exist even at the at the grassroots level so, so all the time there, there's a like a confusion between state broadcast and public broadcast and this is where we should all work to uh, uh, to 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 uh, uh, re, uh, re, re ensure that this is a public broadcast that have a role and one of the main roles is to support uh, local content and sometimes it's in the terms of uh, ref, of the uh, fetter uh, uh, conditions and terms of the public broadcast, but also they are not enforced. So, Thank you, Leel. Any other one who wants to? Okay. Um, I have, I would like to answer uh, our friend from uh, Botswana, who, who was asking about what is the relevant content? What is the good content? Of course, uh, 50 seconds of uh, video will be, it is a content, and it may be important for people. But in my point of view, the relevant content and the good content is the content which is uh, useful for the community, for the grassroots. You will see in the future with the, the, the Internet of Things that we will need a huge number of applications for those things that we will remote uh, uh, control. And uh, those applications, if you take them from the north and they will be cheap on, on the shelf and you can take them very easy, if you, if you uh, buy them from the north, they will not be adapted to our needs because they, was, they were made for their need. So a local content and local language is very important. And any content which is useful for the grassroots, for the population, is the good content. I don't think that if we have only those small videos about music, etc., we are producing content. We are not. Also. There is another issue, cultural content. We are not producing cultu cultural content. And this, this is something very difficult to, uh, to address in my point of view. And I don't think that we are able to address it. 
but uh, we have the opportunity of, as I said, the, uh, for, for our young people to, to, uh, to produce applications in the future. And if, you, if we will be um, uh, present in, the, in this market, it will be a good market. There will be money in it. And, we will, and, and it, will, it will serve our grassroots, our population. And I think that it will be really the aim of our effort to, uh, to promote local content. Any other uh, question? OK. The last word. No, not <coughs> now. The last word. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, moment. A small moment. OK. Who? Zina? Yes, please. Uh, about content. Uh, a rel a question of relevant content is really debatable, but I think that content should be open and then filtered by the users themselves because sometimes short videos are also like a key or, or a starting point for some people to become famous or to get their messages done like in startups. As for music, f for example, some, uh, I heard wants a piece of music played by a small kid and it became universal because it's a simple content. Of course, of course. Uh, I didn't say that they are not important. They are important for the people, for, they are useful. But there are other things that are really useful and vital for our uh, population and we need, we need to develop content for them. Okay, uh, the last word. You? You want so, to? So, sorry, yes, yes. One more thing to add. Yes. I gave it as an example only to say that, especially in in Arab world or some countries, we should let the the users themselves or the population build its own uh, selective uh, filters and not by the governments as it's happening now. Not at all. <laughs> okay, Olivier. Uh, just uh, one remark. Uh, I would like to say that uh, in the update of the Arab Roadmap on Internet Governance that, uh, dra that was drafted during the last few months and that will be published for uh, public consultation in the coming two days, uh, production of local content uh, is set as one of the priorities to work on. Thank you. Thank you very much for the information. L last word for our forum. Olivier, ah, Olivier, you want to speak? Okay. Olivier. Yeah, thank you, Tijan. You're Olivier Clapin Blanc speaking, and, and I'm uh, taking notes, but I speak in my own, um, uh, my own voice. Um, just one thing about content. The, 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 I've noticed there's two different types of content. There's the deep cultural content that might actually take a lot of resources for quality programs and so on. There's also what we call popular content, which actually is very popular with the younger generations. You'll find YouTube channels with millions of subscribers with content that you might look at and think, oh my goodness, what is that? But um, it's actually low cost to produce. And there are real opportunities today. There are some people who in one year are collecting 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 subscribers. I've noticed, and I, I do follow this quite closely, there are very few MENA region blog, uh, vloggers, video vloggers, very few of them. There should be more. Uh, there's certainly a market for that, and uh, certainly in local languages. And that's something that can, um, that can go very quickly and, and give rise very quickly. And it also produces some income because of the YouTube rules, et cetera, and the, the advertising that you can have on those. Thanks. Thank you, Olivier. Win, please. Very, very quick. Uh, I mean, we're the last session on the agenda, so we we, uh, we already used 10 minutes over time, but that's, uh, nobody is killing for us for that. I uh, just wanted to tell you, uh, thank you very much. I think we really managed by joining your session to get a lot, a lot of input. Uh, I'm so lucky there is a transcript, otherwise I would have been taking notes at uh, 100 kilometers per hour or something like that. Uh, there are two things uh, that are, one thing I, I really heard that, that's so useful uh, was one of the panelists giving a description of what roles of different stakeholders could be, uh, making suggestions on uh, civil society, government. Uh, I think that is something that directly can go in, into our work. And on the other, the second thing is, um, we have been collecting examples, and I say we had some from uh, Latin America, we had some from Asia Pacific region, we, have, we had some uh, from Europe. Uh, I think with 
what we collected here, but don't hesitate to uh, contact me afterwards also. I'm happy that they're, they're also one from your region. Uh, and it, it's important to have them in two ways that you are able via the BPF also to put on the table of, look, these are our, our issues. But I think your issues and your solutions might also be very useful for people uh, dealing with the same topics in the rest of the world. So thank you. And uh, just to finalize, reinforcing first our big, big thanks uh, for merging. I think it was really useful and uh, it accomplished the purpose of having more inputs. And as Wynne said, since we didn't have many uh, information from Mina, I think it's going to be very useful for the BPF itself this year. And as looking ahead and looking for next year, uh, we would really um, enjoy to receive your support and uh, perhaps continuing forward a, net, a second year or a third year of the BPF uh, in 2018, tackling all the issues that have been raised from copyright, digital, um, uh, uh, cultural gap, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the forum and thank you for our, all our thank panelists. You, you. I, th I think they, uh, they deserve uh, an applause. I think this session was uh, productive. Unfortunately, there is a few attendance because of this change at the last minute of the room. <coughs> but uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you again for being here. Bye -bye. Thank you, Tijani, for your uh, leadership. Thank you. <laughs>